Well, the UN says the worsening humanitarian crisis in Afghanistan must be addressed now and warns that it's up to the world to prevent a total economic breakdown that could push millions more Afghans into extreme poverty. The country's new leaders, meanwhile, appear focused on asserting their power. These are new images from the Panchi Valley, the last holdout region to fall under Taliban rule. But resistance forces there say the fight has just begun. A few more foreign passport holders were able to leave today. It's the second time in two days that a Qatar Airways plane has departed Kabul airport for Doha. A Qatari official telling us that 158 passengers are on board, including European, American and Mauritian nationals. Well, this all comes as the U.S. prepares to mark the 20th anniversary of the 9-11 terror attacks that led to that war in Afghanistan. CNN's Nick Robertson joins me now from Kabul for more on both of those things. Uh, Nick, firstly, this flight that uh, has just left, uh, a short time ago left Kabul airport, the second in two days to leave with some foreign nationals. And again, it seems this is an exchange for aid. The flight came in carrying aid from Qatar. There's been, I think, now uh, seven or eight uh, aid flights from the United Arab Emirates, uh, several uh, aid flights that have come in from Pakistan yesterday to Kabul, uh, today to Kandahar in the south of the country. 158 people, as you said, passengers got on board that uh, chartered Qatar Airlines flight, flew out of Kabul into Pakistani airspace because it's the closest uh, spot to get out of Afghan airspace and then down to uh, down to Doha in Qatar. Canadians, Americans, uh, Germans, French, British, Dutch, Belgians, uh, all on board that aircraft. We've heard from the French Foreign Ministry, they say 49 of their nationals got out on a flight today. They didn't specify that they were on that Qatar Airlines uh, charter plane, but they say that 49 of their people got out of the country. So it does seem to be, and this is what we've heard from the US Secretary of State, from uh, the Qatari Foreign Minister as well, that the Taliban are keeping uh, their word and and assisting in their actions to get some of these people, foreign nationals, out of the country that they were promised. Still a long list of other people uh, due to get out. Uh, and so these flights that we've seen yesterday, 113, 158 today, it's a trickle compared to the number of people still waiting to leave. And Nick, of course, uh, this tomorrow will be the first anniversary, the first 9-11 anniversary without any U.S. troops on the ground in Afghanistan. Uh, you, of course, have been covering this for, for the last two decades, and you were in Kabul uh, during 9-11. Uh, just explain what lessons have been learned. Yeah, I think it's going to be a long time before you know, lessons can be fully digested and even sort of turned into, uh, you know, turned into appropriate measures to compensate in the future. And, and certainly, I think there will be historians uh, that would argue uh, some of the same mistakes get repeated, uh, things of sort of um, cultural awareness of trying to sort of get too quickly into sort of uh, either you could call it nation building or at least trying to sort of improve uh, the economy of the country. One of the things that has definitely improved here over the past 20 years is the economy. Also, the diversity and inclusivity has improved. But the Taliban takeover now uh, really is in many ways a, a reset, a potential reset towards their rule back in uh, uh, 2001. Behind the Taliban's newly painted huge flag, America's Kabul embassy. Inside the grounds, buried under a plaque, debris from New York's twin trade center towers. Ten years ago, America's then ambassador, Ryan Crocker, who'd overseen the memorial on his first tour, told me it was there so future diplomats would remember what triggered U.S. involvement in Afghanistan. Nick, what do you have for us at this point? We just had an impact uh, perhaps a few miles away. I was in Kabul during the 9-11 attacks. Each major anniversary, I analyzed the intervening years. This was 10 years ago. There are no signs yet of serious contact between the Afghan government and the Taliban. And it could be that the Taliban will wait out the foreign presence here. Our permanent guarantee. Crocker wanted the talks, 
but doubted the Taliban would negotiate in good faith. Their goal is rather simply to re-Talibanize Afghanistan, to retake the country. Um, uh, and if they do, then al-Qaeda is going to be back in here. The only reason al-Qaeda isn't here now is because we are. Fast forward to today. 20 years of foreign policy fears realized. American troops and diplomats gone. The Taliban ousting the U.S.-backed government, capturing much of the inventory of the Afghan army the U.S. helped build, proudly showing off warehouses loaded with weapons. Look, these boxes are full, all new, unused. More, much more than the Taliban ever had before. The new Taliban government as uncompromising as the one America ousted after the 9-11 attacks. Their newly appointed powerful interior minister, Sirajuddin Haqqani, has a $10 million FBI bounty on his head for ties to terrorism and al-Qaeda. In 2020, they promise not to fight for power, but to negotiate in good faith promised al-Qaeda won't use Afghanistan again to attack the U.S. Now there is another potentially more dangerous enemy rooted in Afghanistan, ISIS. We drove this road to Kabul just a few days before al-Qaeda's attack on September the 11th. Al-Qaeda was in the mountains over there in Tora Bora. Today, it's ISIS that's a bigger threat here. The roads are in better condition now thanks in good part to American tax dollars. The town's brighter, better developed, more prosperous, all a positive part of the legacy of America's longest war. But here's the hard reality. Because of years of evolving and often intertwined agendas and alliances with al-Qaeda and similar groups, at a grassroots fighter level, if the Taliban tries to crack down on their former brothers-in-arms, they could face pushback, even division, in their own ranks. Right after the 9-11 attacks, we asked Kabul residents what would happen if U.S. forces came. The result of Russian aggression was the breaking of Russia into 16 countries, this old man says, remembering the 1980s Soviet occupation. If America attacks us, Allah will divide America into 52 pieces. Back then, it seemed inconceivable America could fail. 20 years later, the Taliban's writing outside the embassy wall, in effect, claims exactly that. The conditions, a possible pariah government, a potential failing economy, point to trouble ahead. And fragile guarantees at best it won't reach America's shores again. So I think trust is the key issue here. Trust between the Taliban leadership and the international community. It's clear that uh, the Taliban have better relations uh, perhaps with Moscow, perhaps with uh, Beijing than they do certainly in Washington and London and many European capitals. Uh, but even uh, China and Russia are criticizing the Taliban for not having an inclusive government. And this really does seem to be a threshold, not just to their governance of the country, Country, um, but directly and intrinsically linked to the amount of support they can get from the international community to run the country and therefore how the country prospers or not. And so trust is really there and, and that doesn't seem to be something the Taliban have particularly built much of since they've uh, arrived here in Kabul. Yeah, it's, they certainly haven't. I'm Nick Robertson, uh, really great to, to see that piece you've put together. Thanks so much for joining us. Nick Robertson there from Kabul. We're well, still to come, even as new COVID cases level off across Africa, the WHO issues a worrisome prediction about vaccines. We're going to go live to Johannesburg to discuss the impact.